What's up, my century units? It's the Sentiment here, so back again with another classic WWE pay per view review. So, we're going back to the year of 2010. Wow, 2010's WWE in the PG era. Wow, that was a bad year. Bad creative decisions, the middle of the Super Cena push, and also we're in the middle of the gimmick theme pay per views, and also we're in the middle of the guest host era of WWE. Wow. It's wonder why WWE in the year 2010 was a shitter year. So today I'm reviewing WWE Over the Limit 2010 at the Joe Louis Arena in Detroit, Michigan on the 23rd of May 2010. The attendance for the show was 11,000. Over the Limit 2010 received about 197,000 pay-per-view buys. A downgrade than the previous year's pay per view. That's the final judgment day in WWE history. Um, the main event of that show was Edge versus Jeff Hardy. It was at the All State Arena. It's for the World Heavyweight Championship. Judgment Day 2009 received about 228,000 pay per view buys. Michael Cole, Jerry the King Law, and Matt Strike on commentary for this show. So, this is the First over limit pay per view in WW history. Like I said, we're in the middle of the gimmick theme pay per view era. You know, like the previous year, the interviews like Hell in the Cell, um, and then early this year, the interviews like the Elimination Chamber pay per view, and then and also TLC at the end of the year. And then, you know, they're going to introduce the Fatal Four Way, Money in the Bank. You know, yeah, look, we're in the gimmick theme pay per views. Um, over the Limit last about three years, you know, they did the second one in 2011 and the final one in 2012. And then they discontinue with the pay-per-view and then introduce Battleground or Payback in 2013 and also Battleground, like I said. Yeah, Over the Limit don't really mean anything, you know, like fast lane, you know. It's funny, you know, in our current timeline, with you know, they slowly getting rid of the gimmick theme pay-per-views. You know, they got rid of TLC. Uh, I mean, recent years, they brought back Backlash and <coughs> No Mercy. I wish they just bring back Judgment Day, Unforgiven, Bad Blood. Um, I don't think. Um, Vengeance. And I, I know they brought Vengeance Day, but I wish they bring back the old pay-per-views. That's just me. So, anyway, so the first match to kick off the show, we got... Uh, Drew McIntyre defending the Intercontinental Championship against Kofi Kingston. So, unusual about this build to this. So, Drew hold on to the IC title belt since February because he, I think he um, actually December actually, like he won the title in December at the first TLC pay per view against John Morrison. Had a lengthy run. So, what was it? December, January, February, March. April, May. So basically, hold the belt for six months. So, so basically, at the time, the SmackDown general manager was Theodore Long or Teddy Long. I'm going to call him Teddy Long, by the way. So Teddy kind of uh, basically stripped Drew, uh, uh, really stripped the belt from Drew. Basically, he attacked Matt Hardy for a couple of weeks. So, and you know, uh, Teddy Long set up the the IC title tournament. Kofi to beat Christian in the finals to win the IC title belt. But Drew kind of like basically played favors to Vince McMahon and basically reversed the decision. So this is set up this match on this show. So the match between Drew and Kofi, uh, like I watched some people's reviews about this show, you know, like, you know, like preparation for my review of this show. They say like it didn't really got enough time. It's kind of true, but I'm gonna be honest. This match, it was an okay opener, but it didn't really lit the world on fire because sometimes these, like sometimes these opener matches and pay per views, it's barely you can get like a bad opener, but or a okay opener. Most of the times, the end will have a good opener. So, um, it was an okay opener. I don't feel like this is a match on a pay per view that people spend a lot of money. I feel like this is a match you'll probably see on a... I feel like it's a TV wrestling match. Probably a match you'll probably see on SmackDown. Try to keep it short and simple. Nothing much important. So it was back and forth. You know, Drew's about the strength. 
and Kofi is the spear and agility. You know, it's funny that you know they are future WWE champions. You know, in the um going into the end and the beginning of the next decade. You know, like because Drew, um, sorry, Kofi was the WWE champion at the end of the 2010s, and Drew was you know the WWE champion in the start of this decade in 2020. So anyway, so in the end, Kofi beat Drew with the SOS to win this match. And become the Intercontinental um, Champion for the really second time in his history. He ended Drew's one and only reign as the Intercontinental Champion. I don't think he won it in recent years, in my knowledge. He went on, to, he went on won the Tag Team Tower Belts with Dolph Ziggler, but never like touched the IC Tower Belt. But um, yeah, um, yeah, Kobe won this match, you know, and afterwards you had uh, Drew grab the mic. And trying to call out Teddy Long to reverse this decision and basically, um, basically, yeah, fire Matt Hardy and Matt Hardy came out, hit Drew with the twist of fate. Then the later on the show, he had Drew confronting um Teddy Long, threatening to reverse the decision and fire Matt Hardy. Teddy refused, and also Drew was smashing up uh, Teddy's address. Um, basically his um, I would say uh, locker room. Not locker room, but kind of like this um office or something. Some, I call it an office. So smashing up the uh, the, uh, the stuff, and also Drew saw the picture of Martha Luther King. He kind of compared himself. He's a revolutionary and and a leader. T Teddy Long is not. So um, they had the rematch uh, the following month at the Fatal Four Way Pay Per View at um in June. They had a rematch, you know, and that, and uh, yeah, Kofi won the rematch. Teddy, you know, like help Kofi wins the title, and this was the beginning of the end of Drew's first push in the company. It's funny that um he went up like given that second push. I'm gonna talk about shortly. It's funny that um the reason why they kill really his first push was ending because of the situation between him and Terran Sorrell. That's Tiffany because Tiffany. You know, was working with Drew at the time. It's funny they end up working with with each other in TNA five years later. But yeah, yeah. The reason why because um basically it was a whole domestic abuse situation. I don't want to get into it. So that really killed Drew's first push. It's really times have changed. You know, Drew. You know, he came back from the company in 2017, and you know, in 2020. Won the you know won the rumble and won the WWE title not once but twice so, uh, you know really really fate worked well for Drew in the end you know he kind of recover, you know got his like career back on track. The Terran Terrell so far she didn't not not really came back to the company she left the company this think in the year twenty ten I think it was later on in the year she got released, and then yeah they kind of reunited in TNA. Years later, and then Drew went back. T Tara and Tiffany was not. So let's move on. So, so the next match we got R R Truth taking on Ted DiBiase Jr. with Virgil in his corner. So this is the whole. This is wow. Ever since Legacy broke up at WrestleMania twenty six, you know, um, basically the Legacy people, the Legacy boys, you know. What split off, do their own separate thing, you know. Um, Cody, you know, we end up becoming the dashing Cody Rose gimmicks, uh, gimmick. You're doing the dashing gimmick and the own dashing gimmick and multiple gimmicks in his first run in the company. Orn was already an established, the established star, but wow, they give him Ted like his dad's gimmick. You know, you know, Ted DiBiase's um dad is the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase Senior. You know, they give him the Million Dollar Belt. And really, the storyline is they're trying to find. He's trying to find a Virgil. You know, he's trying to offer our truth to be his servant, but our truth kind of refused. I understand it, it's a bit of a bit of a racist thing because the both well, Virgil uh, and our truth, they are black. I don't want to get into it. So, um, I guess I'll speak more about DBRC after this match. So, yeah, the match was okay. It wasn't a bad match. It was filler. I feel like a match you probably see on Monday Night Raw. In the end, R Truth got the victory, hit like a corkscrew, I think it was quite a corkscrew kick. And yeah, that was it. Yeah, Virgil did go involved a bit, but yeah, not a way to push DBS. So, like I said, they're trying to make him make 
him more like his dad, you know. The difference between his dad and his and DiBiase Jr. because his dad's got charisma. T DiBiase Jr. doesn't have any charisma. And uh, it's funny that, um, yeah, I think it was a mistake breaking up Legacy. You know, it's a good faction. But yeah, Orin went off to do his own thing. You know, he's actually he's an established star. He went on to win more world titles in his career. Cody, you know, he became dashing Cody Rhodes, undashing Cody Rhodes, you know, um, grow a mustache, be part of, you know, teaming up with uh, Damian Sandow, Team Road Scholars bit. Um, that was like 2012, 2013, and then he was becoming his, da uh, his brother's gimmick, you know, Stardust. That was a pulverizing gimmick. Yeah, you had runs in the Indies, a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee in TNA, then AEW. It's very really like he's back in the company right now, you, you know, being the American Nightmare. I don't want to get into it. I don't want to get into Cody's second run so far. Um, yeah, I find it he's a hypocrite, but um, with DBRC, yeah, it really it didn't do any favors, you know. And as for Virgil, he ended up leaving the company afterwards. You know, you never see Virgil ever again. In my knowledge, I don't think he paid in WWE television in recent memory, in my knowledge, but, um, so, yeah, um, they're trying to, it's not a way to push DBRC, you know, yeah, um, he end up, like, she, yeah, end up teaming up, uh, really, like, in this on-screen relationship with Maurice, and the whole feud with Goldust over the Million Dollar Championship, yeah, he ended up, like, um, doing the whole DBRC posse gimmick, but, yeah, it was not really getting over as well, so, yeah, yeah, like I said, I think the only reason why he never got a fair share in WWE was his charisma, he doesn't have no, he's just basically got no personality and charisma, you know, like, um, you know, he's never won a singles title belt, you know, I don't really count the million dollar title as a major title, because, you know, he's, the only title he's won was the, uh, I think it was the World Tag Team Championships with Cody, Besides that, he's never was a world champion or a mid card champion. Yeah, the million dollar title, not really. Yeah, they brought it back in, you know, in recent years in well, twenty last year, you know, having L.A. Knights, you know, right now with Max Dupree, with it in NXT one point one one point oh to two point oh. I think I think the recent I think the recent champion is um Cameron Grimes. I think um anyway so. Enough of my spiel, so let's move on. It was an okay, okay match, by the way. Not bad, but not great. So, moving on to match number three, I think. Uh, yeah, match number three. This is technically the match of the night. We got CM Punk taking on Rey Mysterio. This is a hair, you know, this is a hair versus joining the Street Edge Society. So, the rivalry started in, uh, like, in, this, like, in, what, March of 2010? You know, basically, Punk, you know, interfering Rey Mysterio's, like, daughter's, um, party, you know, singing Happy Birthday to Alayla, uh, was it Alaya? That's her name, Rey's daughter. Then at, uh, you know, WrestleMania, Rey, uh, Rey won the first match, and then at Extreme Rules, the, um, following month, um, you know, this is basically, I think it was, uh, Mass versus Joining Stray Society, Punk won the second match after the, um, help by the Mass Man, that's soon to be Joey Mercury. So this is the rubber match of the rivalry between CM Punk and Rey Mysterio. So if Rey loses, um, he will force to join the Strayed Society with um, uh, Luke Gallows and Serena. Right now, uh, Serena did be in AEW. Uh, I think uh, Luke Gallows is Dark Gallows in Impact Wrestling. I don't know if she, he's part of, still with New Japan. I'm not really too sure. And also Joey Mercury, you know, that's, I don't want to get into it, so. And, and, and yeah, if uh, Punk loses, he'll get his head shaved. So Punk's gimmick is basically a mixture to becoming Jesus Christ and Charles Manchin, because he has the long hair, he had the beard, he had chest hairs around his body. Um, the match was really good, back and forth. Uh, Punk uh, bled in this match, you know, Ray, her Karana, uh, Punk. It was a, basically a baseball slide in her it, it was a baseball slide in her karana and punk's head kind of smacked the um the barricade he bled then you got the guy wearing black you know he's basically a medical team you know, a medical doctor and then wiping the blood fans booed because 
Yeah, because at this time they banned blood. They've been the big ban. They banned blood since two thousand eight. I don't know if they still do that. You know, they kind of relaxed it a bit. You know, in recent years. So anyway, so they kind of used the um the barber chair as a weapon, like basically, a uh, punk throw a uh, uh, miss ray like a dart uh onto the um barber chair. That was that was cool. Um, uh, try to keep it short and simple. I really like it. It's just reversals. It's not like a bona fide spot fest. I'm not crapping on spot festers. Sometimes spot festers could be a good thing or a bad thing, a hit or a miss. So, you know, every time Punk trying to go for the six one nine, um, uh, Punk, uh, no, Ray was going for sorry, Ray trying to go for the six one nine. Punk counted. <laughs> sorry, I'm speaking too fast. You know, mix and get my get myself mixed up. Um, anyway, so, um, I don't think Punk. Uh, trying to hit Ray with a six one nine, he kind of uh kick uh Ray's block, he kicks his knock his block off with the um, I think it was a roundhouse kick. So in the end, uh Ray, you know, I think Ray was going for like kind of a hurricane runner, but Punk counted try he kind of he kind of trying to set up the um the GTS, but Ray managed to counter it, hit managed to hit the six one nine. He was going for the splash. Punk basically got out of the way, he kind of smiles, take the, the pin, trying to pin him, he, try, he was basically taking his time, trying to like pin slowly, it was taking too slow, trying to pin, had that smile, but in the end, Ray rolled up Punk for the win, so Ray won this match, won the feud, and yeah, Punk forced to get his head shaved, and then you got the rest of the straight society uh, coming down, really basically stopping Ray fulfilling the stipulation, so you you know basically had um, Luke Gallows, Serena, and the the masked man. That's like I said, it's Joey Mercury. Then we got uh, yeah, Ray was saved by Kane. This is before the whole who attacked Undertaker and put the Undertaker in a vegetated state. That's the buzzwords of that year, vegetated state. So that was before that. So Kane came to the rescue, and Ray handcuffed Punk onto the middle rope. And shaved his head, not necessarily bald, bald, but he cut his hair. Unfortunately, the following, yeah, the following episode, yeah, the following episode of SmackDown, he ended up wearing the Git mask, and that was it. So Ray went on to do his own thing. Punk. This was the beginning of the end of the Straight Edge Society, because uh, I'm gonna say it right now, like, man, I, I wish Punk kept his hair. He ended up having his head slipped back, you know, but. He's never. Grew, I don't think he'll attempt to grow his head. Uh, grow his hair long the same, but um, yeah, this was the beginning of the end of the Straight Society. I like that group, but yeah, they end up getting destroyed and demol really got um wiped out by the Big Show in the summer. You know, at Money in the Bank. You know, you had a you know basically you had a basically Big Show remove Punk's um head. You know, he had his. He's, bit, he's got a bit of a. You can call him a skinhead. And then at SummerSlam, this was the beginning of the end. You know, like I said. You know, Big Show squashed the Shredder Society, and then in the autumn, the faction was gone. I wish I, I could, they could bring, the group could have a reunion, like, you know, because I, I got to, you know, you know, you had Giles and Anderson appeared in AEW television, you know, because they're, I think they're still in a working relationship with Impact Wrestling. I think they could do that, and also Serena is in that company, um, Punk's in that company, they could probably, one day, could reform the Shredder Society, you know, Punk. Punk being the leader, uh, Gallows, Anderson, and Serena being their followers. They could do that, but mm, that's just my that's my opinion. But um, yeah, it was too short for that group being disbanded. So, so moving on to the next match. So the next match, um, yeah, um, this is for the Unified Tag Team Championships. Uh, we got um the Hot Dynasty. That is Tyson Kidd. Um. D.H. Smith, it stands for David Hart Smith with Natalia in their corner, defending the, the Titan Tower Belts against Chris Jericho and The Miz. Wow, so so this is all about the United States title because Miz was the U.S. champion on the go-home show to Raw. You know, you had Brett defeating Miz and Brett won his last title in his career. And then the following, I think the following, um, yeah, the following, you know, really the, the Raw after this show, Brett uh, vacant the belt, and, you know, R-Truth defeat the Miz for the US title, and then Miz managed to win back the US title. And that was R-Truth's one and only reign as the United States champion. 
before you do the whole shit with the 24-7 tile bell in our current timeline. So, no build to this. And also this whole stuff with Miz and Jericho. I get they were teaming up with the Big Show, show Jericho and Show Miz. I, I like Jericho way better than Show Miz, in my opinion. So, yeah, this is head cheese, man. I know what again the reason why. I feel like this is head cheese. If you don't know why it's head cheese, is, it's basically just random guys with random gimmicks. In a tag team for no fucking reason. Match was good. I like this match. Back and forth between both guys. It's more between the Hart Dynasty and Jericho. Because Jericho did train with the Hart Family Dungeon. You know, I don't think he wrestled in Canadian Stampede. Yeah, he had runs in ECW and uh, Smoking Mountain Wrestling. And then in the major companies in WCW and the WWE. So, I understand why, you know, they had, you know... It's like you had some connection with the Hart family because, like I said, trained in the Hart family dungeon. So, back and forth. Um, in the end, yeah, Natai did got involved. But I think, like, um, um, I think it was a, a small package attempt. You know, Miz was going for his sharpshooter because it's the same same submission hole that he lost the United States title to Bret Hart on the go-home show. So, anyway, so, Kid, basically, I think he kind of a small package, Kid out. Um, in the end, I think he kicked out from the, maybe, I think he kicked out, I think Jericho hit, um, I, I think it was D.H. Smith or Kid with the code breaker. I, um, I think Kid got out the, um, the, the walls of Jericho. I'm trying to keep it short and simple, folks. So, in the end, um, the Heart Dynasty won this match, you know, they hit the Heart Attack onto the Miz for the win. So, the tactic between Mer Jericho and Miz, it didn't last long because Miz... It were, I think it benefit Miz than Jericho because with Miz, you know, because the following, uh, not not from, because uh, yeah, he went on to win the United States title, like I said. Then in July at the first Money in the Bank pay per view, he went on to win the Raw Money in the Bank ladder match, and uh, at the end of the year, he went on to cash his Money in the Bank briefcase on Randy Orton to win his first of two. WWE Championships, um, it benefit The Miz, but for Jericho, after losing the world title to Jack Swagger, the SmackDown after WrestleMania, he really did nothing. He did absolutely did nothing after losing the title, and he did do nothing. Yeah, he was in Team WWE Team Nexus uh, match and at SummerSlam that year, but he ended up like leaving the company for two years after Night of Champions. So, and also again. Punted in the head by Randy Orton on, I think it was the Go Home Show to Hell in a Cell, I think. I'm um, not too sure, so. Anyway, so moving on to, and so yeah, speaking of Randy Orton, so we got Randy Orton versus Edge. So, how we get there? So basically, like I said, of course, Jer this was after the draft, so Jericho was drafted to Raw. He should have stayed on SmackDown, in my opinion. You know, this was after his feud with Edge ended, so. Edge, you know, he's... Why he's going for the World Heavyweight title because he won the Rumble early that year, lost the World Title match to Chris Jericho at that year's WrestleMania, ending the feud with Jericho. So he wants to face Swagger for the World Title, but unfortunately he got drafted to Raw. He turned on, turned a uh, really turned heel, cost Randy Orton a shot at the WWE title. It, was, it did the, they did the whole beat the clock challenge. So it basically say he wants to start out. Um, Basically, a start out uh, fresh. For weeks now, he ended up attacking Randy Orton, hitting him with the spear. So, this match, wow, this is this sucked. You know, um, I think it's a little late doing this rivalry because yeah, they had a rivalry in two thousand four. I think they missed the point, missed a, a great opportunity to have a rivalry in two thousand seven because the former members of Rated RKO. Very underrated tag team, in my opinion. But, you know, they went on their separate ways. You know, Raw, Orton stay on Raw. Edge went on to go to SmackDown, become a multiple-time multiple World Heavyweight Champion. So, yeah, I think it was a little late of doing this rivalry. And the match, it was not that good. It was mediocre and boring. And Orton got hurt, you know. Here's it. Here's the, um, I think the reason why he got hurt. So, Edge kind of thrown Orton onto the barricade. And um, I think he was selling his uh, mid-session and his uh, arm. So 
Here's the coup de grace about this. So Orton was going for his typical smack in the ring. You know, every time he hits like his opponents with the um DDT onto the middle rope, did the pounce. No, nope, he's selling his arm. Looks like the the thing he announces like he's like tore like hurt his forearm, his bicep, his separate shoulder. He announced that he had like problem had shoulder problems in the past. Orton was basically like selling, not like having pains with his arm. Walking around the ring at ringside, so the ending like this: Edge was going for the spear, Orton got out of the way. Edge hit his head onto the um the barricade, and the match ended in a double countout. So yeah, it was a dud. Um, the end of uh, Orton's injury wasn't that serious. I think he went on to, I think he competed at the Fatal Four Way Pay Per View at the uh I, on the following month's show. I'm not too sure. He's not like he's out for for months. You know, he did compete in the uh, both Edge and Orton. I think Edge and Orton went on to compete in, at the Raw's Money in the Bank ladder match at the first Money in the Bank pay per view in July. Go and check out my review of Money in the Bank 2010 for more, more basically more information. So, I don't think they had the blow off to that rivalry. It was very forced. You know, it was just like you know because at the time Orton and Edge had nothing to do because they because Orton. Lost the world title match to Jack Spiker at Extra Rules. Edge and the rival with Chris Jericho. So let's pull him in a random feud for no reason. So they won't fight again for another 10 years. I like their recent rivalry from 2020. I like the Last Man Standing match. Granted it was a bit too long. But I still like it in my opinion. And also yeah. The whole greatest match ever at Backlash 10 years later. Was not necessary but still a good match you know. I like that rivalry in 2020, then their rivalry way back in 2010. That's my opinion. So, and spe spe this and speaking of a crap match, we got Jack Swagger defending the World Heavyweight Championship against The Big Show. So this is the experiment of, yeah, <laughs> Jack Swagger's time as the World Heavyweight Champion. So at WrestleMania 26, you know they did the final. Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania before they made before they did the whole Money in the Bank pay per view concept. So Swagger won the Money in the Bank briefcase at WrestleMania twenty six. Then the SmackDown after I think it was yeah SmackDown after WrestleMania he cashed the briefcase onto J Chris Jericho won the world title for the first and only time. He went on to face the Undertaker on a Raw for the world title and then he def defend the world title against Randy Orton at Extreme Rules. So this is the beginning of the end of Jack Swagger as the world champion. So Big Show got drafted to SmackDown and knocked out Jack Swagger with the W was it the weapon of mass destruction. So WMD. So and also the build to this he smashed Jack Swagger's trophies. He kicked a football in the crowd. Yeah, it's just like that's a way to build up Jack Swagger. Wow. Match was shit. I got I looked it on Wikipedia, it was five minutes, so I glad I didn't admit it made it too long. It was between Big Show had the most of the offense. most of the offense, you know, you had Swagger working on the leg, chopping Big Show down. I think he hit hits him with the Swagger Bomb. In the end hit the Big Show in the head with the World Tile Belt. And the match ended in disqualification. Yeah, that's the way to build up Jack Swagger, man. Yeah, the whole Jack Swagger experiment, yeah, it did not really come to fruition. It never worked. It was too soon. This is the reason why Money in the Bank is so... This is the reason why you should never have got the Money in the Bank briefcase. One nit nitpick about Money in the Bank, you know, you're putting on guys who are not really ready to become the world champion. Ne they never, like, get out the card. You know, get out the mid-card. They never, like, mid-card championship. Punk... Yeah, he was a mid-card champion. No, he was ECW champion. Then he was the world champion. So it's so forced, in my opinion. You know, it's a, I, I have, you know, it's a mixed bag uh, opinions about Money in the Bank. So he was a loser. Um, you know, he was a loser before the when he was world champion. He was a loser during his world title reign. And then that, you know, the good and then the coup de grace of his reign. He dropped the world title to Rey Mysterio. In a Fatal 4-Way match at Fatal 4-Way the following month. And then Swagger never touched the world title ever again. Yeah, he feuded with Dalriel for the belt in 2013. And never won the never challenged the world title ever again. 
he's still, yeah, he's part of Chris Jericho's group, um, you know, in AEW, you know, the guy who beat Jericho for the title in 2010, future Inner Circle members, and also Jericho Appreciation Society buddies, so, moving on, so, the next match, um, and this is another short match, we got Eve defending the Divas title against Maurice, Eve won the title from Maurice, and then Maurice went for weeks attacking Eve, like, during her photo shoot, the match was a piss break, keep it short and simple, the most notable is Maurice's leg, so basically, you're trying to hit, um, Eve, in the head, near the ring post with the roundhouse kick. She trying to go for the roundhouse kick. Eve got out of way. Maurice leg hit the ring post and well, she selling an ankle. So I'm trying to keep it short and simple. And afterwards she was not selling the ankle. I thought that was serious. Um, in the end, Eve retains the towel and that was it. So Maurice, that was a mistake putting the towel on Maurice, you know, because at the time they were hiring like models instead of like women could actually go in the ring. <laughs> It's really time to change, you know, the start, you know, hiring wrestlers can actually wrestle. Women can actually wrestle instead of, like, just model models, you know, models who actually suck. They're there for the eye candy, so. Moving on to the main event, folks. We got John Cena defending the WWE Championship against Batista in an I quit match, so... Recap, so at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view in February, Cena regains the WWE, or really won the WWE title from Sheamus in an Elimination Chamber match with other six competitors. Then they kind of react the whole situation at New Year's Resolution 2006, you know, Edge cashing the briefcase onto Cena. So, you know, Batista, you know, beat Cena for the title on the same night to win his one and only, or first, his second WWE title in his career, he won it the um you know the previous year in two thousand nine against Randy Orton at Extreme Rules, I think. So, so at WrestleMania, Cena regained the title against Batista, made Batista tap out with the FTF at Mania twenty six. Then Cena won uh, the match again. He well, regains the title at uh, Extreme Rules in a Last Man Standing match. He had basically duct tape Batista's legs onto the ring post. And so, this is the blow-off of their rivalry. So, I quit match. So, basically, for weeks now, basically, you know, Batista attacked Mark Henry. You know, um, he won a beer clock challenge to face Cena for the title on the show. He, yeah, beaten down Mark Henry, um, locked in with the rings of Saturn. In the video, they don't really officially call it. They call it the Batista bite. It was, yeah, it's the Batista bite by the end. They don't really officially call it the Batista bite. So, it's on a... You, you, you know, go and play WWE 12, you can probably find Batista, you, you know, his submission hole. It's, yeah, it's the Rings of Saturn, but, you know, it's a, I call it the Batista fight. So, on the go-home show, Batista locked the hold on Cena. And then, before this, the actual match begins, he grabbed the mic, says, I, to I, I told you I made you tap out. And then, this, this is a stupid thing. So, the, re the referee said, Cena, do you quit? Um... And Cena kind of hit, I think he hit C Batista in the head with the mic. The match was good. And also the core conclusion, of course Cena's not going to say I quit. He is, he's the Superman, he never gives up. I like this I quit match, you know, but um, this is the second, a second place. You know, the best one, the best I quit match with John Cena was him and JBL at Judgment Day 2005. Besides that, other matches, you know, like the Miz in the following years, Over the Limit pay-per-view, and I haven't really seen the Rusev one. It'd be a typical scene of bullshit, you know, he gets beaten down, gets his comeback, and made the the opponent made his opponent say I quit. And also Orton in that breaking point, so I haven't seen that match, so we might do a ranking in the future, but um anyway, so um this was good. I like this match, you know. Um not a match of the night, you know, it's the second best match of the night. You know, some people find it boring. I don't really call it boring, I think it was a good match. Um, so basically, you know, Cena locked Batista with the STF, the STF, and this time he made Batista pass out, but, yeah, and he, he came out of the ring, grabbed the, uh, a bottle, a bottle of water, throw the water in the face of Batista, and also the reason why people don't like I quit matches in WWE, the referee holding the mic, you know, every time, like, a wrestler got beaten up, you get the referee says, what'd you say, what'd you say, do you say I quit? You know, it gets fucking annoying. Um, 
you know, just do it. Just say, just say, would you quit if the rest is ready? If they lock in a submission hold, um, it's the if it's the right time to feel like if they want to quit. Not like doing this every every five seconds or ten seconds or two minutes. Like, do you want to quit? Do you want to quit? Do you want to quit? Come on now, it gets annoying. So, anyway, Batista roll. Basically, he um power running running power slam. Oh, by the way, <laughs> in that um unif uni in the um unified tag and tail match early on that show, uh, D H Smith. I think he hit the hit hit his dad's finisher, the running power slam. I think it was on Jericho or Miz. One of them kicked out. So. That's a bit of a side note, but anyway, so back to this I quit match, so, yeah, Batista hits uh, Cena with the running power slam, it's a shade of his feud with The Undertaker in 2007, Cena bled, and once again, the referee, <laughs> wipe up the blood, not referee, but the medical team, you know, the guys in black, wiping the blood on Cena's head, like I said, you know, it's been two years, you know, at the time, they banned blood for two years, and I think like later on in years in WWE they kind of relax the situation, didn't you know? But um anyway, so um they were fighting on the they were fighting the crowd, and Cena from Batista onto they were fighting the stair the stair the stair rails of the crowd and on the top floor. Cena throw Batista off. He he kind of landed into the fans, the crowd. I'm guessing the plants. That's okay. Um, he can tell Batista's nose are annoying, but like I said, the referee keeps saying, you know, pointing the uh, microphone into the uh, the unconscious wrestlers on the ground. Said, "What you quit?" Anyway, so I'm trying to get get to the end, and so, yeah, Batista went into the car. It was a red car, and trying to run down John Cena, trying to kill Cena on live pay per view. So he didn't. So. In the end, Cena. I think he Cena hits. I think he hit hit the AA onto Batista onto the red car. Then he he grabs Batista. They're on the top of the car, and Cena trying to AA Batista off the car, probably through the stage. Batista say, "I quit." I I let it slide. So Batista uh, Cena won this match, retained the WWE title, and then afterwards Cena AA Batista. Through off the car and and through the stage, it looks fake. You know, it's not likely they intentionally did that. You know, it's a way to run off Batista, and and that was it. So and after and afterwards, you know, but to end the show, Sheamus came out of nowhere, hit Cena with the bro kick, and that was it. And so and and then the following month's pay per view at Fatal Four Way in the Fatal Four Way match, Cena, uh, sorry, Sheamus defeat John Cena. In the Fatal 4-Way match at Fatal 4-Way to win his second of three WWE titles in his career. And his third one was in, you know, five years later in 2015. So, yeah, this was Batista's final match of his first run. I think he said it in his return interview when he came back in 2014 that in that match with John Cena, um, he broke his back. You know, yeah, um, he, yeah, he got injured, you know, because the following, the following episode, really the raw after Over the Limits, you know, he kind of like was in the wheelchair, was holding, wearing a sling, got a black eye, um, yeah, on a wheelchair, like I said, um, and then, you know, basically, um, you know, basically, Bret Hart at the time was the raw GM, uh, asked Batista to compete in the money in the, not money in the bank, uh, the, trying to qualify, wants to compete in a match with Randy Orton, to be in that Fatal 4A match at uh, Fatal 4A, Batista kind of reviews him um, hurt, so he lost, basically he lost, technically he's, he lost the match with Randy Orton by default because he was in the wheelchair, and Batista said, I quit, and that was the end of Batista's first run in the company, it's funny, that's like his de he debuted in the company in the year 2002, you know, he was the deacon to Reverend Devon in the beginning of the first brand split in the company, then for all the rest of the PG era in the it's not PG era, the Rufus Aggression era, you know, on Raw he went on to be part of Evolution with Triple H, Ric Flair and Randy Orton. Then he went on to become a multiple time world champion, a six time world champion in his career, in his first run in the company. Then um I don't know and by the way, this is the final pay per view before the start of the Nexus um invasion, so 
If Batista never got hurt, um, would Batista be part of Nexus or against Nexus, feeling with Nexus? I don't know. I don't. If Batista was still around, never got hurt, you know, maybe this whole thing is just a work. Um, I think it is still a work, but if this whole thing was, or even didn't really literally broke his back, you know, um, did he will be, be part of the Nexus stuff? Probably not. I, I think, like, leaving the company was the best decision. I think, in my opinion, I don't know if he'd be part of Nexus or join, uh, feuding with Nexus. I think he'll probably get lost in the shuffle. I think, yeah, it was, leaving was the best, it was a blessing in disguise, so, I think Batista was slowly, basically winding down his career, I don't think, I think he'll probably retire around 2011, 2012 time, I don't think he'll come back in 2014, so he came back four years later, and he shit the bed, he shit the bed in his second run in his, in the company, you know, Winning the 2014 Royal Rumble match in the expense of Daniel Bryan. He became Blue Teaster, Boo Teaster, Evolution Reunion. Um, Competing in the Triple Threat match at WrestleMania 30. Then, then SmackDown 1000 uh, Evolution uh, Reunion. Then, his really his final match as a pro wrestler against Triple H at Mania 35. And then, I think, he's not in the Hall of Fame yet, you know. There was rumors like he was about to be in the Hall of Fame for 2020, but the whole COVID-19 pandemic hit. He didn't got inducted, and then I think he, like, declined it or somewhere. I can see Batista being in the Hall of Fame in the future, so, yeah. It's the way to, you know, he had a great career. So, the I Quit match, you know, with Batista, it was good. I give it the second place. But, um, yeah, um, anyway, so my final rating for the first Over Limit pay-per-view that is over the limit 2010. I give it a 6 out of 10. Actually, I'll give it a 5 out of 10. Wow, this is a... It's not... Like, I think the show is a bit mediocre. Nothing's terrible. But at the same time, nothing's good. You know, I feel like it's inconsistent. You know, you know, okay, okay. Match of the night. Um, decent match. You know, good match, by the way. You know, I'm talking about the Universal... Um, the Unified Tag Team Tower match. You know. Um, and the main event. But besides that, you know, like this, the bad is the bad. Like, I put the Divas Tower match, that's more like a piss break. Um, the World Tower match was just a farce, you know, that was Jack Swagger and, and Big Show. And Orin and uh, Edge, that was not a good match, you know, before, you know, Orin's injury. The OK is the OK, the first two matches, you know, that's Drew versus Kofi for the IC title. And, um... R Truth versus um, Ted DiBiase Jr. That just belong. Those matches belong on an episode of Raw and SmackDown. But on the flip side, the good is the good. You know, I, um, they, you had you know the main event was good. wasn't great. You know, I like the I Quit match between John Cena and Batista. At least Cena put up his dukes. Not this whole shit like getting beaten down for the whole bulk of the match. Get his comeback. Make that person say I quit. You know, at least Cena put up his dukes. Pull up a fight. You know, that was good. Um, I like the unified Tag Team Town match, you know, Heart Dynasty versus Jericho and Miz. You know, I wish they never broke up the Heart Dynasty, in my opinion. And also the match of the night, um, that is Rey Mysterio versus CM Punk. So, I don't know. I, I'd rather skip this show if you got this on the network. So, anyway, so I hope you enjoy my review of WWE Over the Limit 2010. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below, smash like button, click the bell, click the like, and subscribe to the channel, be part of the central unit for more wrestling videos and more. Next time, we're going back to 1997, see how Undertaker, Brett, not Brett, Undertaker, Austin, Sean, get a and Mankind, Helmsley get along. Yep, it's been a long, it's been a long time since I review a King of the Ring pay-per-view, so I'm going to review a classic King of the Ring pay-per-view. I'm going to review King of the Ring. 1997. So this is the Central Man officially signing out. Check you later, folks.